Hello, everybody. And welcome to the Urban Design Group's Idea Space. I'm Scott Adams. I'm an urban designer. Um, and obviously, you're quite used to probably the Zoom sessions. But if you haven't, please put your microphone on mute. And when we go to questions and answers, then you can unmute your microphone. Um, this is the first of a new series called Regeneration Stories. And we're just testing out Idea Space with this session of focusing on a place. And it might be a place that you know, it might be a place that you don't know, but hopefully it's where we can share a bunch of ideas and learn from the overall experience. Um, Bayero is in Portugal, just south of Lisbon, and I'm introducing it as both a, a personal and professional focus for me. Um, uh, basically professional because of my urban design interest and, and experience in regeneration, but also personal as an active participant in hopefully driving the social regeneration of this place. And I'll be doing that with Marco Smeraldi, who's a brand and marketing manager, who is next to me. Hello, everyone. I'll introduce the overall area, and he will join in specifically on, on a specific site. Uh, we have an exciting panel of guests today. We have Sarah Mikado, founding director of Stroop Landscape Urbanism Studio, followed by Ewan Mills, specialist in digital planning, and Kenny Ash, uh, the co-founder of Ash Sekula Architects. Urban Nows is recording the session, and it'll be put up on the Urban Design Group's YouTube webpage in about a week. Um, the format for the day is I'll present a few slides with Marco, and then we'll hand it over first to Sarah, then Ewan, and then to Kenny, and then we'll have a discussion amongst the panel and open it up to questions for everyone out there. We also have the chat, so if you've got questions during it or key points, you can add it to the chat. You can add questions during, during the session and we can pick them up, or when we ask questions, you can raise your hand. Um, but essentially, the question, I guess, is for everyone, what is Bayero? What's it look like? Why are we talking about it? Let me share my screen. And essentially, Bajero is an area that's just south of Lisbon. There's the, the Tagus estuary, the Tagus Bay, and it has a direct ferry link to Lisbon. Lisbon's a renowned place known for its recent regeneration in the last 10, 20 years. Um, and, and it's a quite interesting area. But when we started looking at a place where we would split time between London and Lisbon, we decided that Bajero was a really interesting place. Um, it's got excellent opportunity, but it has huge challenges equally. Um, there's road connections by the two bridges to Lisbon. It's about a half an hour drive with no traffic, which is rare. Um, but importantly, there is the 20 minute ferry. It's also the terminus of a line that takes you south to, to a big city called Setúbal. And what's quite interesting about Lisbon is it's known for what it looks like today, the, the image on the left. It's the public realm, the vibrant streets, maybe not in the last couple months, but um, the small scale streets, the trams. But what's interesting is not too long ago, it, there was, it was more common to see images to the right where there was an eroded public realm. There's disinvestment in buildings. Um, and, and so it's in that context that we want to speak about Bayero. The actual area sits within its own council called Bayero. The antiquity area, the, the historic areas in, in the, the Magenta, it's along the riverfront. And it was hit early, early days, it was a fisherman's village that turned into a, a very big industrial area. First, the industry was to the west, where you see the sand beaches in the, in the river. Um, there was mills powered by wind. And much later, there was much more heavier industry located to the east. And those are the empty sites in the gray shadow of, of, of the plan. Um, to the south in the blue, you see the, the, the train terminus, but also the ferry terminal. And it's just north of the rail line, which we're going to be focusing on in, in the following slides, of the really compact streets and tight areas that um, is really ripe for a certain type of regeneration, but still it's uh, lagging quite slow in the process. And I think there's huge opportunity there. This is what the ferry terminal looks like with the ferry boats overlooking those, those sand beaches. And just in the far, far distance, you can see a glimpse of Lisbon in the hills. This is the promenade. This was once all sandy beaches. This is where the fishermen's houses backed onto. And it was invested in um, the public realm some time ago, but there's a linear park that fronts onto the river now. And this is what it looks like in the other direction in some of the re remnants of both the industry, but also the emerging leisure activities that are happening on the water, especially now that the water is cleaner than it used to be, although a lot of people tell us it's still quite dirty. The recent investment is in key areas. So along the riverfront, we have the promenade, 
there's recent um, uh, sports and leisure um, public realm features. So this is a, a recent investment in um, a basketball court and there's exercise equipment adjacent to it. And again, you see Lisbon in the distance. And the front row of development probably happened maybe, well, probably about six, seven years ago. They, they created a, a, an economic inducement to promote development. It was a regeneration area. And so there was some new development. So you see the house on the right, expense, some expensive houses on the riverfront. There's others next to it that were just refurbished with the historic core. And then next to it is an example of a cafe. And next to that is this big 60s block. So you get a huge mix of different types of uses, different uh, states of regeneration, different states of buildings and uses on the riverfront. Uh, there's still some empty sites, because again, this was the back of the fishermen's houses. So you see that in the bottom right hand corner. And then the building in the back that has the nice mural on it, um, that's actually the council offices. And there's lots of murals throughout the area, as you probably expect being in the context of Lisbon and what we know about the street art in the area. Other plots that are vacant have been taken over by the community. Someone, I presume it's one of the houses that you see in the back, started um, planting and guarding this empty site. A lot of the sites aren't looking like this, they're just vacant. Um, but this one actually is the link between the riverside and the first street. And the first street used to be the high street because this was the closest route along the riverfront. And so this was full of mixed uses. Now there's just residential or empty buildings. So the two on the right are the refurbished buildings fronting onto the river. Obviously, they're the most desirable. Uh, the rest of the sites are either derelict or um, still in use by lots of the remaining older community that, that still reside here. And there's also lots of um, people that are squatting in properties, but mostly significant portions of buildings are empty. And as you'd expect, the further away from the river, the worse it, it actually gets. Um, but there's something really nice about the historic buildings and also the street grid which is an orthogonal plan. So you get lots of views that link down to the river. And what we found out here is houses are owned. There um, is uh, people pass them on as heirlooms and there's second and third houses that families have. And, and as they get um, handed down, there could be 12, 20, 50 owners that share um, the property. And it becomes very difficult to have agreement how it's sold, how it's re repurposed. And with the recent downfall of the area in the last few decades, a lot of houses just were boarded up. And what happens is eventually by benign neglect, the roofs cave in and it becomes an empty site. Um, and even when, when they're boarded up, uh, they're, they're broken into, they're gutted, um, people live in them, but essentially it just doesn't help with preserving these, some of these great buildings. And a lot of times then the next thing that happens is they're knocked down. So there's lots of tooths also in the fabric of, of empty sites. And so that, that leads us to, from the professional side to the personal side, where we wanted to actually contribute to the regeneration, the redevelopment of a place, and um, contribute to a place, but also have a bit of fun. And so we bought the, a house, the second block in um, from the riverfront. It's a ruin, technically classed as a ruin, and it's surrounded by three sides by streets. So it's a really compact, compact block with about um, six houses within the one block. Um, but has a direct route to the linear um, park and the riverfront. It has a direct route to a little square, has lots of potential. Um, it's two stories in the front. Oh, there's a one story extension and the garden area is about 15 square meters, but it's actually full of um, illegal buildings. So we need to knock those down. Um, but essentially it needs a lot of work. <laughs> and and um, Mark is going to talk about some of our very developing initial ideas for, for the building. Yes, hello everyone. So as Scott was mentioning, we've been very attracted by the area and fascinated by its potential. Um, we purchased the property and you know, our initial aim was to have a more standard um, Airbnb um, refurbishment and then kind of making an Airbnb business. And we quickly realized that actually we could have done something way, way more adventurous and more interesting, I would say. And that passion and interest we had in the area we wanted to show it to other people. So we thought, is there a different way um, to show people this potential that Barrero has? At the moment, it's a very dormant um, part of the greater Lisbon area. Uh, not many people know about it, not many people go there. So we thought, how can we contribute to the place um, and make our place a way to uh, grow the place further? So in the building, as you can see to the left, 
there's a backyard area. This is the current state. So our idea that came up really two weeks ago, so quite fresh in mind, the very, very initial stages is why don't we, um, why don't we chuck down those, um, th those buildings in the backyards and, and build a space that, you know, is not a rental space, but it's a space where people can participate into it and where we can basically participate with the community and grow something different. Um, we wanted to make it a space for people and we saw examples from, you know, from, from how retail is going more into participation models rather than just selling the product of making workshops and events. And the same things is happening in hospitality as well. And we have the example of Mercato Metropolitano, for example, in London that is not just selling to people and talking to people, but is having a conversation and bringing people into the development of things. So, that's basically what, what we have in our mind. How do we make it a space for people? And um, we, we made a plan to ref refurbish it very cheaply. So how can we bring in some very, very basic, um, basic, basically furnitures or basic refurbishments to then have classes, whether that's um, events or collaborations or um, movie nights or dinners. Um, to really bring people in and, you know, give back to the community as well and show people the potential that we see in Barreiro. And I think what's important is we're looking at something that's very affordable, something upwards of 3,000 euro to actually make the space habitable in a very basic way. Um, and, and interestingly, it's challenged a lot of my thoughts of, of what I've experienced in the last um, years of leaving regeneration processes. And it's interesting to think about this place of how, how can you promote regeneration with, in the context of, of what's happening the world over with, with COVID, with the climate crisis, and then probably the new economic reality that we'll face. But how do we actually promote regeneration and true regeneration, less so than gentrification? And we've seen a lot of that in Lisbon, and that's something that we don't want to um, promote in a sense, but it's, it's, a, it's a tough line to, to balance. And, and can this place be more than just refurbished houses and those using those by people commuting to Lisbon or Airbnbs, that was our original plan, and we just don't think it's the right idea for the place. So how do we achieve community and social uses and, and promote a really, really vibrant public realm? It doesn't necessarily mean installing a high-quality public realm, but how do we use the spaces and have people create a, a really great community? And, and how do we balance top-down and bottom-up measures? So in a sense, we have an expert panel, three great people to talk about anywhere from the micro to the macro. Um, and so I'm going to hand it off to Sarah. Hello, Hello. everybody. I'm, um, I'm Sarah. I'm calling um, in from Lisbon as well. I'm going to share a presentation on, um, on this, basically a storytelling about Lisbon and Bahairu that is here, but actually is also in so many other places in, in Europe happening. And here we are again, not in a crisis situation. We've been here before um, in a very different crisis situation in 2011. And in Lisbon, what, uh, um, what Squat was telling about, there was incredible opportunity for all, this por for all the Portuguese to, to change. And they were able to change, many of them left, uh, but the ones who stayed behind mostly changed their profession and the city of Lisbon changed with them. There were many important uh, public realm projects with this idea of making Lisbon more competitive and attractive to foreign investments and visitors and, and tourists especially. And this had a huge impact on the real estate, which turned into a housing crisis uh, with very prohibitive prices uh, to rent or to buy for most of the Portuguese population. And so today we find at the moment in the city center of Lisbon over, in the historical center of Lisbon, over 20,000 um, Airbnbs. And needless to say, they're all empty at the moment, right, with this indefinite term of uh, post-COVID. Uh, and on the other side of the river, just a couple of uh, uh, meter, uh, kilometers away, uh, we have Bahairu, which has this beautiful views to the river, cheap housing prices, and this really strong identity. So I'm going to tell the story about these different lives that uh, Bahairu had and what, wondering what's going to be the future life of it. 
Um, so here we are in the 15th century, Portuguese sailors at the vanguard of the European overseas um, exploration. And Barreiro plays this important role as the shipbuilding complex. Um, and continuing uh, through the, um, to the, half of, uh, the first half of the 19th century, one would find large cultivated areas, permanently vineyards, producing this famous uh, liquor, Bestardinho, that would be drunk in, in, would be drunk in the best houses of, of the capital. But it was also an important uh, place for salt production and, um, and of course, um, um, a privileged space for the, for the windmill. Well, first um, the hydraulic and then later on windmills. Um, but later on, I find myself in the, in the mid-19th century and it's extremely exciting because um, the railway station is built in Bahairu. And this transforms Bahairu radically into this main node that connects transporting of goods and people all the way from the north to the south of the country. And Bahairu became this very attractive place to install industries and developed into the largest uh, industrial centers of the, of the country. Uh, it's especially led by Kuf, um, this, uh, this company that was founded by Alfred da Silva, a Portuguese businessman that builds in 1907 their industrial complex with several factories from uh, fertilizers, chemicals, oils, metal working, and only the factories counted with over 11,000 workers. So Kuf was like this empire um, and was part of Stado Novo, was the dictatorship uh, with the production of gigantic, uh, with the production of gigan gigantic proportions. Uh, but also a very self-sufficient character. If I would work in the factories, I would have access to housing, to education, to sport facilities, health services, theater houses. And, and so Bahairu boomed uh, with all these facilities until the mid 70s, until the 70s. The company was then nationalized in 75 after the, the revolution. And currently, the old territories are still uh, are state-owned, and they're managed by by a state-owned company. So, in the 70s, Bahairu had this large working class, but also this very elite of engineers, highly qualified um, people, and reached its top in, uh, with 85,000 inhabitants. And ever since, the population has been decreasing, the decreasing ever since. And um, but Bahairu had this really incredible association movement, and uh, that allowed. Um, uh, so in this, since the beginning, since the mid of the 19th century, there were several recreation societies with spaces for interaction, meet, meeting points that promoted proms, soirees, uh, theater clubs, philharmonics, sports clubs. And, um, and actually jazz orchestra, which was quite unique in the country. And so in the, in the 60s, 70s, the associative, all this associative movement also allowed for huge manifestations of social and political resistance to the regime, opposing the dictatorship um, and raised all this awareness for lack of freedom and that the country lived at the time. And so, during this period of the revolution, it, these collectives had really important libraries where you could read many of the books of the censored by the, by the regime. Currently, there's still over 60 active associations uh, in Bahairu, and this popular associative movement has been playing like this very irreplaceable social role in, in the city. But then came the 80s, and uh, with the, all these highly polluting industries started to close. And so what we were left with was this highly contaminated soils. But Bahairu was still this focal point for mobility on a national level. It's connected by train the north to the south of the country. So until 1999, there was no train connection across the river. If one wanted to go to the Algarve from Lisbon by train, you had to take the boat to, the, to, to Bahairu. Uh, so it still had this strong transportation um, role to play. But then a very decisive moment arrived um, in 1998. Bahairu lost the big opportunity to build the second Tagus River crossing to, into Lisbon. So instead of bringing Bahairu closer to Lisbon, uh, it actually, the, the bridge was, was built in Alcuxit and connected to Expo 98. And 
that was that had a major impact on Bahairu because it also lost all the following investments and and so Bahairu is still feeling that very strongly today, keeping on hoping for this third bridge as um, as an anchor to to come back into into a stronger real estate position. So we find ourselves today. Um, uh, well, well, with the with the turning of the century, that Bahairu uh, lost not only all the industry, it also lost its position as a major mobility node. And yeah, and we're trying to, and the city is trying to reinvent itself and see where where to go. So picking up on this strong social and local identity. Uh, but presenting this major mobility issues, unemployment issues. Bahairu has invested in the public realm projects, um, renewing the waterfront, promoting the requalification of the city, the historical city center, pedestrianizing a couple of streets and open spaces, as Scott was mentioning. And it's kind of hoping for more investments and thinking of ways how to, um, how to capture this, also this, this romantic idea of the foreign investments. Um, but it is trying to promote this strong artistic component, reinforced by this uh, art piece of Vils, a renowned Portuguese artist who moved the, his um, workshop into Bahairu, and start trying to state this as an anchor for the city and develop more the cre creative industries that would connect this urban art scene to the industrial territories. But this industrial territories, which are a huge um, piece of land in, uh, in Bahairu, although they're state owned, they're completely walled, inaccessible, and to, to any residents. So the state, the state managed company that runs this, uh, this, this territories has shows a different kind of plan for the, um, for the development of the city. So here we have these two major gener generation projects um, promoted by the municipality. Uh, you have Quinta Brancam, which in this plan looks like a really small investment. It's actually not. It's uh, quite a big, they were thinking of like a big urban park but with also some, some housing um, opportunities to build. And on the left side, you have Kimi Park, which is the old industrial site. And they have these pharaonic plans that almost kind of claims half of its land to back to the, to the river. And it's completely anchored on this idea that there is going to come the bridge and the bridge will arrive to Bahairu. And, um, and it kind of doesn't really address any of the issues of the city center and of the unconsolidated Vacant, uh, uh, vacant plots um, inside the city, and especially in this scenario of post-COVID, I'm sure this, this, this municipality had, but I'm sure it's transversal to so many other municipalities all over the world, you have this major pharaonic plans with huge investments, and how will they in any way or form respond into this post-COVID and this new crisis where um, in climate change crisis we're going to we're going to face so at the same time with these huge plans we have this uh, small walkable city socially infrastructured uh, with cheap houses young population partly unemployed and uh, many vacant and rundown houses in the historical center so how how can we change this reality? And well, are these plans actually, this type of planning and regeneration projects actually addressing any of these issues? So I launch here my, my question for discussion, which is following this pandemic that demonstrates this huge potential to transform the public space and uh, where you have the search for parks, outdoor meeting places, where we are rethinking the way we move and the way we're gonna walk around the city or go to work. We try to avoid these crowded public transportations. Um, and it's, it's really forcing us to search for, in our own neighborhood, to, to what, what we need and to bike through the city and walk through the city much more. How can we innovate and create this dynamic use of public space um, as a stage for meeting, for being creative, but in a very fast and effective way? And not so, it kind of seems that this, it's time to rethink this idea of tourism, of Airbnbs, of housing, of public space, and putting the population in the center of the decision. 
uh, kind of think, is it useful to make plans for tomorrow with these visions of how reality was pre-COVID? And um, let's open up for dialogue and for action and uh, for experimentation. So it's, um, so this is a little bit where I would leave the presentation for us to discuss um, in the later on in the next uh, slides. Scott? Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and, uh, lots of information, really interesting presentation. And now we're going to move on to Ewan um, before we go to um, Kani, and then we'll have the, the discussion afterwards. Great. Uh, OK, that's my share. OK, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so, uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Ewan. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting to start from, um, this is how, how we started this decade. We tend to forget it because of where we are now, but, but the uh, fires in Australia, uh, uh, civil unrest, both in Europe and, uh, and the Middle East, uh, uh, Venice flooding, right? So from, 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 from climate disaster to, to, to social unrest, the decade was already promising to be uh, challenging. And then within months, we fell into this, this, this new state, which feels very much like some form of science fiction film. Never, no one ever actually ever thought that something like this could actually happen, uh, which is the, 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 the pandemic uh, uh, that, that, that we're going through. In the backdrop of all this stuff, there is still, as was before the pandemic, this accelerating kind of technological force, right, which is changing everything uh, uh, about the way that the us as kind of uh, homo sapiens uh, uh, live. Uh, uh, and, and I think the examples of Lisbon and Airbnb uh, is only one of the examples of, of, of the impact of that. Uh, and there's also, well, at least there was until a few months ago, the kind of this continuating, continuing uh, 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 kind of force of urbanization, right? People moving to, 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 to urban settlements. I was always fascinated by this fact, uh, by, by these numbers from, from LSE cities, which actually showed that not only, I mean, we all know how fast cities are growing in terms of population, but what was interesting is actually pop uh, uh, urban population uh, urban footprints we're actually growing at, uh, at twice the speed um, of urban populations now whether this is going to continue or not uh, uh, given kind of this global pandemic that we're going through is going is going to be something that, that we'll have to kind of uh, uh, wait and see and, and see what happens so so in this context right so 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 with with, this, with the scale of change which is I don't want to use the word unprecedented because everyone's kind of using that now, but, but which we were already seeing before this pandemic, right? The need to actually kind of change, the need to, to pivot the way that, that, that we actually uh, uh, live. Uh, how do we start rethinking kind of the way that we, that we actually kind of shape human settlements, right? Uh, and, and we're seeing lots of examples coming up post-COVID and it's very tempting to start coming up with all these new models of uh, wider footways or, or, or socially distanced offices or whatever else it might be. But, but my view is, is that, that actually we need to think more, more structurally and more uh, fundamentally, not only about kind of the, the shape of kind of uh, human settlements in the future, but more importantly, the, the, the things that shape that, right? So the, what, what kind of uh, uh, um, Indy Johar often refers to as the stack, right? That shapes human settlement. The institutional institutions that, that are there, the regulations which are there, the, the financing mechanisms, uh, the ownership structures, right? How can we start thinking of different ways to actually do this kind of stuff? For example, on, on, in the finance world, how do we start moving away from, from uh, uh, kind of uh, very classic kind of rent extraction activities that that this pandemic has actually made very, very, very explicit where, where we see uh, uh, mean landlords kind of complaining that they can't actually uh, get their rent paid and therefore they're struggling to pay their mortgage. And you realize kind of the, the, the inequalities that, 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 is around, that are around there. Things around decision making, right? So, so, so people have been kind of talking about kind of democracy being in crisis uh, 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 for a while. Uh, and and I think I think there's never been as much emphasis on kind of uh, at the minute it's it's national leaders, but it, it probably will come back to our local leaders, our kind of city leaders as well. Third, the, the the regulation stack, right? So this is everything from your your planning regulations to your rules and to your laws. Uh, how do we start thinking about? We know that this kind of stuff doesn't work, right? So kind of like I've been working out for the last five years, particularly focusing on 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 planning uh, uh, regulation. 
uh, because because it, it's not really working as well uh, as it should be or if at all. And then lastly, kind of uh, the ownership level, right? How do we how do we start reconsidering uh, the way that ownership actually works? Now, I think it's a challenge for you, uh, Scott and Mark. I mean, uh, how adventurous you're going to be uh, be with with your with your up, upcoming project, but. But how do we start thinking? There's some really interesting work, for example, uh, that uh, Open Systems Lab have been doing of actually kind of creating alternatives to, to the traditional, for those of you in the UK, freehold and, and sharehold, right? Uh, the idea of a, a, a fairhold model. How can we start kind of reinventing uh, uh, these models? And, and now the reason that these, are, these, are, these things are interesting and particularly relevant to this, because you might ask, okay, this is great, but, but so what, right? It's because I think there's opportunities in, the, in, in, in places which seem to have kind of fallen through the cracks of kind of the contemporary structures which are shaping them today. Now, now whether that is a, an abandoned building or a squatted building or a neighborhood which is kind of, kind of a, a, a completely uh, uh, left, I think they, they, these places present an opportunity to start reinventing and experimenting with the structures that actually shape them, right? And, and so I guess this is kind of the, the, the question that I'd like to, to explore in, the, in this talk is, how can we start thinking about these forces which shape places in new, new and different ways? How can we start kind of reinventing and rebuilding some of these? Aware of this kind of context of not only kind of a, a, a huge kind of economic upheaval, but also uh, immense kind of technological um, um, opportunities. So, that, yeah, so that's, that's it for me. Great, thanks, Ewan. Uh, again, <laughs> super interesting presentation. Um, and now we're gonna pass it on to Kenny and um, go to another super interesting presentation. Yes, I'm sorry. I got that from Angela. Thank you. <laughs> um, so th the thing about this space is it's really fascinating. Um, it's um, a little place which um, apparently from our talk, Scott, um, isn't... Um, there's there's um, the planning authorities uh, see it as a, as a place for um, experimenting as well. They're really desperate for um, multiple... Um, even very micro investments to come in and try things out. And so we've, what and, we've and got here is- Introduce that as well. Um, the council's really open to ideas, but right. also because it's before 1951 and the planning policy being implemented, you actually don't have to follow a lot of the planning regulations. Um, Sarah would know more about that, but um, you know, they were telling us that you could do whatever in the inside, but as long as you preserve the outside. And I think you don't need a residential permit because it didn't have them back then. So there's more opportunities as well. So it's almost like a, an area which is redlined to do um, something um, of, a, of a kind of multiple experiment. And the idea that you're going to do one of them is very, it's very exciting to be talking about something this real. I suppose like following on from what Ewan was saying, I think that the answer to the, um, the question of how do we start, where do we, where do we um, start to tackle this is, um, something called the which some people call the foundational economy i don't know how many people use that terminology but it's also called in the uk the preston model um or the brixton pound or the top nest pound but it's the idea of like spending money locally and that that um starts to build um social relationships as well as economic relationships between people and that the um the kind of networks that you get with that um, do have a kind of virtuous circle um, because the when you build up the local economy and it's um, it's actually uh, can start with some quite small exchanges or an evening in your yard but the point is is that because people are saying do you know what Marco and Scott are so cool they're talking you up and then you're talking them up because you say, you know, the old people next door, they, they're really good. They, they started teaching us how to do this dance or um, had some suggestions about Fado singers. And um, that um, it's very difficult to promote yourself. I mean, we all have to do it at work, 
But when you're trying to live somewhere and you want to build something authentic and holistic and really exciting, then you want other people to talk you up and you want to talk them up. So this, this kind of um, psychological um, virtuous circle can, can actually build quite quickly. And I think that's, um, that's something that's um, really interesting. So it's kind of a win-win thing. But at the same time, like we're all terrified because um, the climate um, emergency is really um, hitting everybody and every investor in, in, in globally, and especially in Europe. People are thinking, well, have I got my um, economic, um, my sustainable governance model right? And if not, I'm not going to get that money. So the, the whole kind of property industry is caving in on itself unless it can get some more certainty in um, the next, um, the immediate future. People are no longer thinking, let's do um, a, a five-year deal and we can slip under that radar. People are thinking, well, I won't be able to shift it in five years. So people have been forced to think about 2030. And that means that we have to keep the fossil fuels in the ground. And that kind of like keeping stuff in the ground, um, avoiding flying too much and traveling too much, is actually a kind of incredibly symbiotic and rather beautiful diagram with um, keeping the money in the local economy. It's like, let's, let's just take a deep breath and let's keep things where they are, but like build micro relationships and micro business. And that's, um, that COVID's come along and has actually made this really clear, I think, to lots of people who felt it was like not really their style to be worried about this stuff or not really, um, um, it was just sounding a bit too hippy dippy, a bit, you know, like um, the Totnes or Brixton or wherever it is that, you know, these experiments have happened. And so, as um, Marco and Scott, the, the kind of aim to start this off is for you to feel like you're not um, spending your life in a, a space which is a bit peripheral, that you, you put a stake in the ground and you say, I feel like really that I'm in the right place. And that's contagious, you know, because then your neighbors start feeling like they've moved in, so they feel in the right place, and maybe I'm in the right place, or maybe they felt that anyway. But the point is, is that this is quite, um, feeling in the right place is the first step to feeling productive in that space. And then when you feel productive, you might not be making mega bucks, or you might, you know, through the wonderful internet we have, but you, you, you'll be starting to feel quite wealthy, like quite rich just in, in your context. Um, you know, the luxury doesn't always mean going out and spending, you know, 30 quid a head each on, on dinner and going to a film or a play. It can actually be this idea of self-made culture that can make you feel immensely richer. And that's because it's like extemporized. It's almost like magic. It comes from nowhere. Somebody starts telling a story and then um, there's a game it gets passed on. I mean you know, you must have all spent evenings like this where something else comes in and we're away from the consumer society and we're into a much um, more exciting place because it's really personal and it's, um, it's not happening anywhere else. It's not a simulacrum of anywhere else. So um, if we, um, I mean, if we make others around us feel blessed and we feel blessed and things, um, then uh, there is this feeling of um, the place, the services, and the anecdotes which become the fuel to make the, those stories circulate and feel um, profitable and actually draw in money. Because let's face it, when people find that there's um, a place that, where you can step off a certain rat run and you can become um, an individual, that's an immense um, pull for people. And you start attracting rather um, people who want to take a risk, rather adventurous people, rather artistic people, um, rather technical people maybe, but um, that, that becomes um, 
particularly now, like how can we live more lightly on the earth? That is a big challenge. And so if it can become, the place becomes the laboratory and the whole thing becomes a challenge, then it invites the um, multiple intelligences to participate in that. And that makes you feel even more special as a person because you've got certain skills, they've got certain skills and they respect you and you respect them and you become a gang. And that's, um, that's incredibly attractive. So um, I think that um, the, the, the point is, is if you can get people's interests overlapping so that your, um, your interest in having fresh produce overlaps with somebody who's you know, gardening in one of those um, dem demolished sites or pocket gardens, then that's a daily overlapping interest. And th th you can start making diagrams like this and you can imagine that um, the, the thing becomes more and more complex, but in rather a nice way. So you're making a network. And I guess like that all sounds like a fairy tale, right? And it is, it isn't, all that easy um, because people are very tricky and they've got pre-established like feuds with each other or new things that can start, a, a spark can start from somebody just not having worn their glasses in the morning and not saying hello to somebody because they didn't recognize them and then that's an imagine, you know, paranoia builds up just as well as like positive stories. So I think that what I feel quite strongly is in order to kind of counteract that complacency where you might just accept that, um, you know, people are people and the best thing to do is like give them a bit of distance and, you know, that virtuous uh, spiral we were talking about, you know, reverses. Um, I think that it's very important to have projects. So we were talking briefly, Scott, about the projects that you've been thinking about. Um, and then I was saying, well, it would be great if you went down to that rather um, soulless promenade and that you could persuade the um, local communist councillors and um, planners that um, every um, six months you were going to build another small piece of tactical urbanism to allow people to walk out over the water and have picnics. That could be something which would um, bring in um, you know, talent from literally over the world. You know, you could make that into um, something of an interesting challenge. And locally, you could find those skills and upskill people to to use um, old materials. So that, there's so many stories you could make with those projects about the circular economy, about the can-doism, about the poetry of the place, about rediscovering what it is to be productive as, as a team, as a gang. And then when there are frictions, you go back to Scott and Marco's yard, you have a beer and you laugh it off, and then you get into your, um, you know, your games for the evening or whatever. So it, it's, it's a sort of activating communities. Um, normally it's really difficult because everybody's got three jobs and like um, kids and old people around them and things. But if you, say you have a space like this where, you, you have some older people with some spare capacity, some slack time. You have some, a little bit of slack time and you have um, a, a bit of slack space. The thing can come together and you can create a new way of doing things, which um, is, is the antithesis of Airbnb because when people have a few slack weeks and want to come and stay with you or want to um, do some activities with the older people or... Um, families move in and things that um, those weeks can be spent productively really building relationships genuine relationships with people and and leaving skills behind or maybe staying behind maybe you decide that um, that is the best place to teach yoga in the world or something and you stay behind so it's a repopulating but only an intentional um, repopulating and an ethos which builds up through act action and um deliberation and i suppose like i had a few slides because we did try this experiment in london <laughs> we won a competition for an empty site well in fact it had buildings on it we were going to use in lots of um ways to house um community activities and artists but they demolished them before we got the site so we had this empty site and 
we had um, four years on this site and we built a kind of um, a, a, a really um, shaky little township um, on this site. And I suppose that the, the reason it might be interesting to just share that with you is that the, each of the projects was distinct and it had a distinct um, audience or a community of interest that made it um, meaningful to do. So if I share my screen with you, um, no. I'm really going to fly through this. So it was um, pre-Olympics. They were a bit worried about this area of town looking a bit sort of uh, run down and dodgy. So they put up a, this competition and we won it for this site. Um, it, um, we called it the caravanserai because we knew it was part of the Docklands and we wanted it to refer back in history. And the word is quite long, but it allowed you to, to spend the time telling people what it was about and that it was about making money and trade as well as um, telling stories, sharing cultures um, and, and, and diversity. So when we opened it, we opened it on April Fool's Day and we all made fish and, and um, cycled them around in races around this site because that was the idea of um, a magical, impossible feat like um, uh, that, um, that uh, you know, a, a, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. I don't know if that, that was the reference anyway. Um, so there was the site that was um, recently demolished. Everything was crushed down and we tried to get a sense of the space using this police tape. Um, we, we thought about like, how, how could we make this a, a space for the people of the neighborhood and how could we make play different um, so that things were extemporized and, and more risky. Um, we built models and played with um, possible futures for different bits of the site. We, we, we took the hoarding and we just extruded it up a little bit with um, roofing battens and some paint, but it made it exotic and memorable. Um, and then we had this, um, eventually we had this um, site with lots of um, what we called pets, which were small buildings that um, we put up. And here are the pets on the, on the um, our website, and you could click on these and find out what you could do there. Um, this was the first one, which was a big feasting table. This was some covered space um, using uh, saris from the local market embedded in um, industrial sheeting. Um, we had fires, which we got the, that was hard to get that in the lease, but we uh, insisted on it because, you know, we needed this to run through the winter. And here's just some pictures of some of the, um, the pets. We, we eventually realized that we needed some proper covered space. So we set up a competition, which was our third competition. And um, it was all about reusing materials. Um, and we gave people a materials budget. And this is what came out of it. Um, people learned lots about reusing old bits of wood. And here was this, I mean, it wasn't quite a building, there wasn't a floor to it, but it was a really great space, which was properly um, covered and out of the wind. And we had events. We, each of these pets were branded in different ways. Um, this was a, um, there were a lot of different overlapping associations that did gardening here. This was one, people in high wheelchairs that did this. Um, and, you know, a space just experiment. And that's the end. The caravans right now. Uh, can I pass you back uh, to the Thank you very much. Sorry, it's, it's always that awkward couple of seconds of trying to unmute. <laughs> um, wow, like we've had three amazing presentations and my my mind's connecting all, all different aspects to, to different points of them. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to start having a little bit of a brain dump, and, and I will ask each of the panel members if they've got a question or a point that kind of links the other presentations together, if they've got a question for any of the other panel members. Um, but I was really, you know, I knew a bit of the history of the area, but, but Sarah, it's just amazing. The, the gravity of the place and how, how important the, 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 the city was to the wider, not only the, the Lisbon area, but the entire country. And, uh, you know, the 60 different associations really, I think, will make us want to somehow get involved with what's already there and how we can start tying these different strings together. Um, and, and Ewan was talking about the, um, um, 
coming up with a structure. And, and I think that's really interesting and it'd be great to hear a bit more of it. But how do you almost create a structure? Because you've got to have an idea of what the outcome is or a vision. So then you have a process to achieve it. So that starts raising questions that if this is a different type of government structure, something that's of today's time, of citizens, how do you actually, do you need to come up with that? Or can you just start coming up with structures by, by themselves? Um, and, and Kenny, we, we'd started feeling like Bayero was the right place for us. And originally we didn't have that feeling. We thought it was a really great place. We thought it was a huge, um, a great place to invest in. And we were hoping it, to see its future be more positive. Our vision of what more positive has changed a lot. Um, and we've taken on some of those hippie values, as, as you called them. Um, you know, the, the place has no windows, so you need windows. So we started looking at people keep on replacing their old windows, their mahogany windows, and they're putting them on the equivalent of a gum tree. And you could get six windows for like 100 euro. And we're like, well, why not just put the original windows in? Because we actually wanted wood windows. And, you know, how do we upcycle everything and make slowly we get the courtyard space? Slowly we start making the interior space. And to be fair, we don't have a big plan yet. We're, you know, we're hoping that we s we'll figure it out as we go because it should be interesting. But then going back to what, what Ewan was saying, if, if there's a structure and if we come up with a process for our space, can we do it for the other spaces? There's empty lots there. There's houses that are boarded up. Can we somehow figure out who the owners are instead of saying, well, they should fix up their house? Can we, can we have an organization that hosts using the space for the next one year, five years, 10 years, and maybe upcycling those spaces. And so there's something really interesting how this would contrast what Sarah introduces, this really heavy top-down approach that, as she suggested, probably won't happen. There's not going to be money for it unless there's some big EU fund, but presumably that's not even the right example to follow for the place, I'm, I'm thinking. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask in reverse order from Kami to you and, and to Sarah to comment or ask questions. Um, and then just to get people ready, there was both a couple. There was a couple questions. One from John Robinson about um, the committee for community engagement, and Jeff Noble for a shared ownership approach. After we have this initial chat, we'll just get to those questions. So if you two can get ready, that'd be great. Kenny. Okay. Um, well, um, 